हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट इन यू वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा Can Paytm be saved? It's India's digital payments giant, a household name with tens of millions of users. It's on the verge of losing its license. The story has been brewing for a few days now. The company bosses are running from pillar to post to contain the crisis, but it looks tough. Tonight we'll put together the developments in the reports to try to answer one question: Can Paytm be saved? Our next story is from Pakistan. Tomorrow is election day. We already know who's winning. It's a sham that the world cannot ignore, though. Tonight we'll talk about what India should expect from this election in Pakistan. In Myanmar the crisis escalates. India has issued an alert. All Indian citizens must leave. The latest tech company to announce layoffs is Snap, the parent company of Snapchat. Caught in a downward spiral, we'll discuss that. In the US the border has become the biggest election issue it seems, and Donald Trump and Joe Biden seem to have the same solution with different names. In Europe farmers have won concessions after weeks of protests in China travel chaos due to extreme weather in Sri Lanka the killing of elephants has sparked concern also a report on how influencers are reaching your children and giving them dangerous advice and how the sun is flipping poles what does it mean and why should you care all that and more coming up the headlines first Tensions continue in West Asia. Iran launches three satellites simultaneously for the first time in Jerusalem. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken meets Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. This comes as Israel and Hamas weigh a truce proposal. Saudi Arabia says no ties with Israel without an independent Palestinian state. Another Indian origin student killed in the US. This is the fifth such incident in a month. 23-year-old Samir Kamath was studying at the Purdue University in Indiana. Just last week Neel Acharya a student from the same university was also found dead. Big embarrassment for Nikki Haley no one won the Republican Party primary in Nevada. Haley who was unopposed was beaten by none of these candidates. She lost to Trump in Iowa and New Hampshire and is likely to lose in a home state of South Carolina later this month. China removes the head of its top financial regulator the surprise move comes amid sharp sell offs in the country's stock markets China is the world's second largest economy in recent months it has been among the worst performing nations globally and unlike hong kong messi doesn't disappoint tokyo he takes the field in the second half of inter miami's friendly a few days back the argentine superstar was a no show in hong kong angering fans there Our lead story tonight is Paytm. Until a week ago it was a celebrated unicorn. Today it's a company struggling to survive. Paytm is in deep trouble. Last week India Central Bank issued an order against it. It's called the RBI, the Reserve Bank of India, and its order came like a death sentence, banning Paytm from most banking services. The order comes into effect in March. So the company is working overtime to save itself and that is the big question right now. can paytm be saved the deadline is february 29th so barely 3 weeks to go there's a lot of speculation talk of a potential sale reports say paytm may sell a part of the business and that there are two suitors in the fray hdfc bank and geo financial services now none of this is confirmed right now but even if a sale is proposed they will need the rbi's permission a sale cannot go through without a nod from the central bank and whichever way it goes the fallout will be immense this is a big company we are talking about paytm is a major player in financial services a poster child of india's digital payments revolution it has more than 300 million active users all of them will be affected by the rbi's order paytm is scrambling to protect its business and to reassure its customers it says its services will continue uninterrupted and that it's working with the reserve bank trying to address the concerns and mitigate the crisis the reserve bank says paytm is not playing by the rules and that it committed serious compliance violations so can the company still be saved at this point a comeback looks tough reports say the reserve bank may cancel its license 
A final call is yet to be taken, but officials are said to be seriously considering this. The company's founder is Vijay Shekhar Sharma. He met with officials from the central bank, apparently seeking some concessions. Either an extension of the deadline or assistance in keeping Paytm's operations safe. What does that mean? Paytm is looking to migrate some of its accounts to other banks. This is to keep the service online for its customers. Now, both these options were discussed with the Reserve Bank officials. And what was their response? A flat denial. So the Feb 29 deadline stays, and the RBI will not offer any assistance to Paytm. The company is on its own, really. The central bank will not nudge any banks to take this up. In fact, it may move in the opposite direction, shutting doors for Paytm. Reports say the RBI has refused to entertain any requests from the company, and they're unlikely to meet Vijay Shekhar Sharma again. It's a very tough approach, yes. And there's a reason for this. The Reserve Bank believes that Paytm was given enough time, a lot of leeway to address compliance issues. And now the bank seems to have run out of patience. But the Paytm founder is not giving up. Yesterday, Vijay Shekhar Sharma met with India's finance minister, Nirmala Sitaraman. We don't know what was discussed. But by all accounts, he sought some relief. And this was most likely a personal appeal to the finance minister. We'll have to wait and see if it helped. Now, Paytm's problems circle around a subsidiary. It's called the Paytm Payments Bank. This subsidiary is at the heart of the payments business. It has a license from the Reserve Bank. But it's not a full banking license. So this company can take deposits, but it cannot lend money. It offers services like digital banking, fixed deposits through partner banks, digital wallets and payments, UPI, which is India's real-time payment system, and FastTag, which is India's electronic toll collection system. All these services are run by the Paytm Payments Bank. Its parent company is called 197 Communications. They, too, offer banking services through various arrangements. But the RBI's orders specifically target the subsidiary, the Paytm Payments Bank. That's the target. Will selling this subsidiary help them? Is that the only way out for Paytm? Well, a distress sale is an option, but it's a very tough one. It would be like cutting the arm to save the body, the last of the last resorts. Will Paytm do it? The next few days would determine the future of this company. <laughs> It's voting time in Pakistan. Just hours from now, polls will open across the country. Some 5,000 candidates are in the fray. They're fighting for 266 seats. But not a lot of excitement on the ground because most Pakistanis have lost faith in the election. They know what to expect. A lot of rigging, a lot of military meddling, and finally, a selected government. This time, it's Nawaz Sharif's turn. The army is backing him to be prime minister again, so it's a foregone conclusion. Yet the world will be watching because this is a nuclear armed state, also the global headquarters of terrorism. A national election here will have implications for the region and the world. Voting will begin by 8 a.m. local time. It will continue until 5 p.m. If voters are in line by then, they can vote. A big challenge will be security. Almost half of all polling stations have been declared sensitive. There is extra security there and with good reason. On Tuesday, multiple incidents were reported in Balochistan, around nine grenade attacks in one day. And the targets? Election offices and polling stations. Such incidents could keep voters away tomorrow. And fewer voters equals more rigging. We've discussed the issues and faces of this election on the show. Tonight, let's talk about the expectations. They're very low, of course, both at home and outside. Take India, for instance. How should India see this election in Pakistan? What does each candidate bring to the table for India? We'll start with Nawaz Sharif. He's a known figure in New Delhi, a three-time former prime minister. His last term was from 2013 to 2017, meaning he has worked with Prime Minister Narendra Modi. 
The two leaders had a warm equ equation. And now we come to the policies. Sharif is a pro-Western politician. Between the United States and Pakistan. He has close ties with the United States. In the past, he has advocated for fixing relations with India. In fact, Sharif presided over the Delhi-Lahore bus diplomacy. He came to India for Prime Minister Modi's inauguration in 2014. And recently, he's been talking about a reset. No country can progress while fighting with its neighbors. So is there a reason to hope? Well, Sharif's track record offers some confidence. If anyone is likely to push for a reset, it is Nawaz Sharif. His manifesto talks about a message of peace to India. Then you have Bilawal Bhutto Zardari, leader of the Pakistan People's Party. India knows a lot about the Bhuttos. They are political royalty in Pakistan, but Bilawal is the new kid on the block. In the last few years, he served as Pakistan's foreign minister, so chances are India got a good look at him. And the impressions can't have been good. While in the US, Bilawal said some nasty things about the Indian prime minister. Osama bin Laden is dead, but the butcher of Gujarat lives. And he is the prime minister of India. Poor move for a top diplomat. It shows that he lacks maturity and experience. Will Bilawal Bhutto be any different as prime minister? It's tough to say. He's talked about ending the politics of hate and revenge. I guess that applies to foreign policy as well. At the same time, he keeps making those nasty attacks. Last year in August, he did the same. He said Prime Minister Modi will become the butcher of Kashmir. It's not the temperament of a statesman. And finally, we have Imran Khan. His term as prime minister was a mixed bag. You did have a few breakthroughs. Like the visa-free Kartarpur corridor, it allowed Indian Sikhs to visit a shrine in Pakistan without visa. Prime Minister Modi publicly thanked Imran Khan for it. In 2021, India and Pakistan also renewed a ceasefire. Again, Imran Khan was prime minister then. But honestly, the bad outweighs the good. Imran Khan made a habit of raising Kashmir at the United Nations. He branded the Indian government fascist. I want to make it clear that any attempt by the fascist, totalitarian, RSS-led Indian government to aggress against Pakistan will be met by a nation that, that will fight for its freedom to the end. The Pulwama attack also happened under him. 40 Indian personnel were killed. So another Imran Khan term is not really encouraging. And not like it matters. You and I have a better chance of becoming prime minister than Imran Khan. At best, his party can make inroads. So my point is, don't expect very much. Pakistani politicians can have the best of intentions, but in the end, only the army matters. If General Asim Munir wants a reset, it may happen. And if he does, this is the right time. General Munir took charge as army chief in November 2022, so he's got a long term ahead of him. India too will have elections this year. All bets are on Prime Minister Modi to continue in office. So there is time and circumstance. Pakistan's economy is struggling to stay afloat. More cooperation with the fifth largest economy in the world is only going to help them. It would also free up his plate. Maybe more time to focus on his other borders, the borders with Iran and Afghanistan. Both have flared up recently, so Asim Munir will be looking to stabilize things there. India, of course, will want results. We have heard promises of peace before. What New Delhi wants is action now, visible and strong action against terror groups. That's the only reason why these elections are key. Because it could be a clean slate. Not because it's a democratic exercise, because let's face it, Big Boss has more democracy than this sham. On to another Indian neighbour, that is Myanmar. It's been gripped by a civil war since late last year, but now New Delhi is worried. The government of India has released an advisory, their first since violence broke out. And what does it say? Leave Rakhine state immediately. If you're planning to travel there, do not. If you're already there, leave. That's the message from New Delhi. Some context now. Rakhine is a state in Myanmar. It is located along the western coast of the country. It is close to, but does not border India. You may have heard of this region before. It was home to the Rohingya Muslims. They were driven out by the Myanmar army. But now the roles have changed. The army is the one being hunted. By whom? 
the Arakan army. They're part of the ethnic coalition against the junta. It's called the Three Brotherhood Alliance, the ethnic coalition. And the Arakan army is fierce. They've made major gains since last year. A number of outposts have been captured. A few cities have changed hands. Even military installations have fallen. The Arakan army says they've captured two junta battalion headquarters in just the last week. Two in one week. In fact, junta soldiers are on the run. Some 260 of them fled to Bangladesh recently, so the Rakhine state is a battlefield and things could get even more ugly there. Which is why India has issued this advisory. But will that alone be enough? I ask because the fighting is spreading. It's not just limited to Rakhine. Violence has been reported in the Shan state as well, in the Chin state, in Karneni and the Sagaing state. So it's all over Myanmar, really. Western countries have started to take notice. They're asking the junta to stop the violence. We strongly condemn the ongoing violence harming civilians, including the military's continued use of indiscriminate airstrikes. We echo the call of ASEAN in urging the Myanmar armed forces in particular to cease its attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure. India too is concerned. New Delhi has not openly criticized the junta, but it has called for the violence to end. Uh, I would like to say that we are concerned with the deteriorating situation in Myanmar, which has direct implications for us. As a neighboring country and friend of Myanmar, India has been long advocating for complete cessation of violence and Myanmar's transition towards inclusive federal democracy. Well, that was last week. And now an advisory is out. India is not just looking at the current crisis. It is also looking at a long-term solution. And what is that? A border fence. It could be a controversial decision. India's Home Minister made the announcement on Tuesday. He said the entire border with Myanmar will be fenced. Plus, a patrol track will be constructed. The idea is to constantly monitor the border. Now, the need for a fence is understandable. Some 5,000 Myanmar refugees have entered India since last year. Dozens of soldiers have also fled here. And in the current context, it is worrying. India's Manipur state shares a border with Myanmar. And right now, Manipur is in the middle of a crisis. Two ethnic groups are fighting there. So the last thing you want is outside influence, making things worse. In fact, the Manipur chief minister has openly called for a fence. But others are not so keen. The chief ministers of Nagaland and Mizoram have opposed it. And why is that? Because of local sentiments. Indian border communities have families on the other side in Myanmar. Right now, they can travel across and meet them. Few checks, no hassles. But a border fence is going to change all of that. It would make travel more difficult, hence the opposition. Of course, the final decision lies with the center. So looks like the fence will be built. It may limit India's exposure to, those, to the civil war in Myanmar, but it's not a complete solution. For that, the fighting needs to end. But will the junta agree to that? They're getting more desperate for sure. On Monday, a school in southern Myanmar was flattened by airstrikes. At least four children were killed. Around 15 others were injured. Now, the junta has not claimed responsibility yet, but airstrikes are their M.O their modus operandi. Eyewitnesses spotted fighter jets flying over the region. Only the junta operate those. The rebels mostly use homemade drones. So chances are this was the junta. And imagine striking a school. You do that when you're desperate, when you want to frighten your enemies. So this war is not over yet. The rebels may have made gains on the ground, but the junta controls the skies. Things could get worse before they get better. Meanwhile, the turmoil in the tech sector continues. Company after company is reporting layoffs and a decline in revenue. The latest one is Snap, the parent company of Snapchat. Snap has reported fresh losses. In the last quarter, it lost some $248 million and the markets have reacted sharply. Snap's stock has fallen by 30% after the results. What explains this? A challenging market? and their revenue is falling. How does the company make money? Mainly through ad advertising revenue on the Snapchat app. But the ad market has been shrinking because economies are slowing down, so companies are spending less on ads, and Snap has been losing money. 
although that's not their only problem. They're also losing users. The Snapchat app is not as popular as it used to be. It is losing the race against big tech companies. Last year, Snapchat had more than 750 million users. Their closest rival is Facebook. Do you know how many users Facebook has? Close to 3 billion. So 750 million versus 3 billion, there is no comparison. But there was a time when Snapchat was very popular, especially among the teens. Its biggest USP was the disappearing messages. Users used to communicate through pictures or snaps, and once they were opened, they disappeared. There was no way to retrieve them. They were deleted immediately and automatically. This feature made Snapchat a rage. The company also had a reputation for being an innovator. Others followed it. Players like Meta frequently ripped off Snapchat's features. Meta, of course, is the parent company of Facebook. It runs apps like Facebook and Instagram. You may have used these face filters. Snapchat was the first one to ship them. The others simply copied. In fact, Instagram's founder, one of the co-founders, had even admitted to this. They said they're stealing features from Snapchat. So it seemed Snap was on top of the curve. Then what went wrong? According to experts, Snap is not falling behind when it comes to innovation. What it lacks is a steady business model. They're not being able to scale it. They're failing to expand beyond the Snapchat app. A few years ago, they launched AR glasses. AR is augmented reality. The project failed to take off. It was scrapped soon after the launch. Next, they came up with a selfie drone. Did not work. Meanwhile, they're also working on the app, Snapchat. They're making changes to the product, developing new features, and opening up new revenue streams. But they have a long way to go. Snap CEO is a man called Evan Spiegel. He says the company is focusing on, quote-unquote, long-term growth. And in the short term, they're taking some tough calls. This week, Snap announced layoffs. They've cut 10% of their global workforce. That's more than 500 workers they've been asked to go. And this is Snap's third round of layoffs. In 2022, they cut around 1,300 jobs. In 2023, they sacked around 170 people. And 2024 has begun with another 500 employees getting the pink slip. To be fair, this is the story across the tech sector. It is witnessing a slowdown. Everyone is announcing mass layoffs. So far in 2024, more than 100 companies have laid off over 30,000 employees. Even the giants, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, they've laid off employees this year after sacking tens of thousands of workers last year. But here is the difference. These companies, the giants, remain operationally sound. They're still raking in billions. Their bottom line is steady. But that is not the case with Snap. It is heading towards a crisis of survival. Big tech can ride through this storm. But smaller companies like Snap might struggle. Continuous losses could push them to the brink. What they need is a pivot. Their survival depends on it. If you ever visit Sri Lanka, you'll notice one thing. The elephant is omnipresent on the island nation. It's religiously significant and culturally central to Sri Lanka. You see elephant motifs in art and architecture. They're also a major tourist attraction. Sri Lanka has the highest density of Asian elephants in the world, but now they're dying in large numbers. 470 elephants were killed in Sri Lanka last year, mostly in man-animal encounters. What explains this trend? And how can Sri Lanka reverse it? Our next report explores. Sri Lanka is known for its wildlife, it's extraordinary, it's diverse, but there is one animal that defines it. This majestic creature, for 2,000 years, elephants have roamed the island nation. They are intertwined with its social fabric, symbolizing power, prosperity and spiritual significance. They were once a prized possession of kings. Elephants were employed in warfare. They symbolized opulence and strength a sign of royal authority. Then there's religious significance. Elephants were embedded in Buddhist religious beliefs. They can be found in folklore. They are symbols of wisdom. These gentle giants are revered as sacred beings. But besides its place in history and culture, elephants play another crucial role in Sri Lanka, that of ecological balance. These majestic animals are keystone species. 
They shape habitats, they maintain balance of ecosystems and support the survival of others. But what about their own survival? Since the 19th century, Sri Lanka's elephant population has fallen by almost 65%. A decade ago, 250 elephants died every year in Sri Lanka. The number has risen sharply since then. Last year, 470 elephants died in the island nation. Most of them were killed. So why are Sri Lanka's elephants dying? The biggest reason is human-animal conflict. Sri Lanka's forests are depleting. Its farmlands are growing. That means more elephants and human encounters. They are entering villages. They are trampling crops. Killing an elephant is punishable by law. But farmers are doing everything to protect their farmlands. This includes electric fences, poison, jaw bombs, aka crude bombs. The other worrying trend is the death of male elephants. A large number of them are dying. They are key for the survival of the species. More often than not, these tuskers venture out, they end up in human settlements, they are stranded and they end up dead. The young ones are dying too. 70% of elephants that died due to jaw bombs were not even adults. Sri Lanka has the highest density of Asian elephants in the world. Once nearly 5,800 elephants roamed the island nation, now the number has dwindled. Experts say it won't be more than 4,000. So what can Colombo do to protect its revered national symbol? Wildlife experts have suggested two measures. More protected areas for elephants and asking farmers to grow crops that don't attract them. Because elephant encounters have a human toll too. Last year, nearly 200 people were killed. Plus there are damages to farmlands. Which means Sri Lanka is at a crossroads. Elephants are crucial for the country, for its ecological balance, for its tourism industry. Its wildlife tourism is worth some $400 million. Most of it's because of this majestic beast. But its conservation efforts are not bearing any fruit. Globally, Sri Lanka had the highest annual elephant deaths. If it doesn't act fast, soon 70% of Sri Lanka's elephants will be gone. So the government has a dual challenge ahead of it. Saving its flagship species while protecting the livelihoods of its people. It's election year in the US, so a good time to look back at Joe Biden's presidency. What do you think was his biggest failure? Maybe the war in Ukraine, or the Israel-Hamas war, or his failure to revive the Iran nuclear deal? Outside the US, yes, these were important setbacks, but if you ask Americans, you may get a different answer. They may tell you his biggest failure was the border. Let's talk numbers first. How many migrants did officials detain at the U.S.-Mexico border? In 2019, around 850,000. That was during the Trump presidency. And last year, around 2.5 million. The numbers are staggering. December alone locked more than 300,000 detentions. But why is this happening? For a number of reasons. During the pandemic lockdowns, people could not migrate. So there is pent-up demand. Plus, Biden's re-election is not certain. If Donald Trump wins this year, he could complete his border wall. So migrants are making a dash. They want to enter before the U.S. election. And what is Biden doing to stop this? Until now, very little. First, he sent his vice president to Latin America. Her message was borderline Hollywood villain. I want to be clear to folks in this region who are thinking about making that dangerous trek to the United States-Mexico border. Do not come. Do not come. No luck. People kept pouring in. Around 70% Americans disapprove of Biden's border policy. They say he's failed. Even Democrats are struggling to defend him. In November last year, five mayors wrote a letter to Joe Biden. These were mayors of Chicago, New York, Denver, Houston, and Los Angeles. All five were Democrats. And what did they want? Better border policies, because their cities are swamped by migrants. In Chicago, they're sleeping outside police stations. In New York, a cruise ship terminal is now a shelter. In Denver, migrant arrivals are up tenfold. So these cities are overrun. They may want to welcome migrants, but the infrastructure is not available. So finally, Biden has woken up. He's managed to strike a deal on immigration reform. It sets aside $20 billion for the border. And what would this deal do? 
Number one, fast track asylum cases. Number two, give more authority and freedom to deport migrants. Number three, reduce parole for detained migrants. And number four, a border shutdown clause. And this could be controversial. It says the president can shut down the border under two conditions. A, if 8,500 migrants cross in a single day. Or B, if daily average crossings stop 5,000 in a week. Mexico is already complaining about this. This is... So, the position of, we are going to close the borders, is very demagogic. For example, I have a lot of respect for President Biden. He has conducted himself very well. So did President Trump before. He was very respectful of us. We understand the circumstances, but imagine closing the border. The deal may help Joe Biden. Just one problem though, Trump and his hardline Republicans won't support it. So chances are it won't pass in Congress. And that's politics for you. Biden had three years to sort out the border, to increase funding, to set up more curbs, but he failed to do any of that. And when does he decide to make a move? In election year. So Republicans are on the charge. On Tuesday, they tried a drastic move in the U.S. House. They moved a motion to impeach President Biden's Homeland Security chief. His name is Alejandro Mayorkas. He's also Biden's top border official. Luckily for him, the motion was defeated because four Republicans decided to buck the party leadership. But next time could be different. So what does Joe Biden plan to do? Campaign on it. His plan is to point at the border chaos and say it's Trump's fault. I'll be taking this issue to the country. And the voters are going to know that it's not just a moment. Just at the moment, we're going to secure the border and fund these other programs. Trump and the MAGA Republicans said no, because they're afraid of Donald Trump. But it could go either way. Maybe voters will blame Donald Trump for blocking the bill, or maybe they'll blame the man in charge, which is Joe Biden. Either way, it's a blemish on his legacy. Some 6.3 million migrants have been detained under Biden's rule. Trump, Obama, and Bush had fewer detentions, so there's no point blaming others. Biden came to power promising a humane immigration policy. The same Biden now says, I will shut down the border. All those people are seeking asylum. They deserve to be heard. That's who we are. We're a nation that says if you want to flee and you're fleeing oppression, you should come. If that bill were the law today, I'd shut down the border right now and fix it quickly. A bipartisan bill would be good for America and help fix our broken immigration system and allow speedy access for those who deserve to be here. The 2024 elections will be fought on a number of issues, but the border will feature prominently Trump, the wall champion, versus Biden, the shutdown guy. It's the same policy with two names. Now let's discuss your travel plans. For work or for leisure, if you're heading towards Europe or China, you may have to reassess your plans because both these sectors have plunged into chaos. Travel has been disrupted thanks to strikes and extreme weather. In Europe, workers across various countries are on strike or they plan to go on one. And in China, the winter storm has turned travel into a nightmare. Roads are jammed, drivers are stuck on highways, many trains and flights have been cancelled. Our next report tells you more. Millions of Chinese citizens wait for the lunar year. It's that time of the year when they get a chance to reunite with their families. But this year their plans have been thrown into chaos. This is a train station in Wuhan. Yesterday, hundreds of travellers were left stranded. A snowstorm led to mass cancellations. Over 100 trains went out of service. Over the weekend, it was the airports. They were covered in snow. Two runways on the Wuhan airport went inoperational. The site on the roads wasn't too different. In the Hunan province, icy roads brought traffic to a grinding halt. The storm has impacted China's capital Beijing as well. It has forced passengers to rethink their plans. I was originally considering how to change my tickets to see if I could change to another train. But because I have my son with me, I'm worried that if we get separated after the change, I won't be able to take care of him. There are thousands more like Sun Zhongwei. China's Spring Festival triggers the world's largest annual migration every year. And this time, China was expecting a massive surge in travel. Travel agents were expecting holiday travel in China to bounce back. 
China's aviation regulator had scheduled 2,500 extra international flights. Transport officials said they were expecting another 480 million rail trips, a 40% rise from last year. But bad weather is playing spoil sport. In Germany too, travel is disrupted, but not because of the weather. It's due to a strike. Workers at Lufthansa are staging a walkout. They're demanding better wages. And they are angry with Lufthansa's management. For us, strikes are only used when there is no other option. But we've now had two rounds of negotiations, which have been really sobering. Lufthansa presented an offer in the last round, but it's not only inadequate, it's also divisive. Groups of employees are being played off against each other, so to speak. It is completely unacceptable to us. Many flights have been cancelled. Over 100,000 passengers are hit. They all have to reschedule their flights. Last week, Germany's transport employees had walked out. The reason was the same, poor wages. This was Germany's third transport strike in two weeks. More strikes are on the horizon in Europe. Staff at London's Overground and workers at the French Metro and Bus Network are gearing up to walk out as well. It seems like 2024 is off to a rocky start for the transportation industry. Europe's farmers are up in arms. They have put down their tools, boarded their tractors, blocked roads and plunged the block into chaos. The first to take to the streets were Polish farmers. They started the blockades last year. It was the first call to action. But now it has spread across the region. In France, farmers blocked highways leading to Paris. They overturned trucks, set up tents and burnt produce. The aim was simple. They wanted to starve the capital. On ira sur Paris. We will go to Paris, show our rage, show our discontent, show that something must be done. Today, the profession can no longer survive. It is being strangled. Similar scenes in Germany. Thousands braved freezing temperatures. They took to the streets and blockaded the country's biggest airport. There was absolute chaos. And the picture is the same everywhere in Europe. In Greece, farmers dumped their produce. In Belgium, they targeted border crossings. In Italy, farmers lit fires. And in Portugal, there were long lines of trucks. Most of it was peaceful. But in Brussels, they vented their anger. It is, after all, the headquarters of the European Union. Farmers rolled into the city, camped outside the EU parliament, lit fires, blared their horns and hit the parliament building with eggs. Soon, the situation turned tense. Police had to be called in. They hosed down the angry farmers. The import in Belgium and Europe is from outside. The rules in outside of Europe are too easy. It's too difficult for us to farm normally on a daily basis. It's too, too difficult for us. We ask uh, easier rules. Farming makes up just 1.4% of the EU's GDP, yet the blockades are a serious nuisance. They've cut supplies to countries. Fresh produce is hard to come by and prices have been rising. You see, angry farmers are never good news, and when coupled with inflation, they spell disaster. Which brings us to three main questions. Why are Europe's farmers protesting? What are governments doing about it? And will these measures be enough? First of all, why the protest? Farmers across the EU have a lot of grievances, a lot of complaints. There's rising debts, cheap imports, price pressures, climate change, and the EU's heavy regulations. Farmers must abide by strict laws which do not apply outside the European Union. These laws make farming in Europe more expensive, so their produce costs more. But in the market, they must compete with cheap imports. Obviously, they lose out. Then there are country-specific issues, like tax breaks and subsidies. Governments are reducing these and farmers don't like the idea, so they've been protesting. And after weeks of protest, they seem to be winning. European governments are offering a compromise and farmers seem to have won this round. The EU wanted to halve the use of pesticides. It has now scrapped the plan. It has also made other concessions. Plus, countries are taking measures individually. France was going to increase diesel tax. It has scrapped the plan. Germany was going to cut diesel subsidies. They watered down the plan. And Greece has announced a special tax rebate on agricultural diesel. So concessions are being granted. But will it be enough? Farmers say they need more. 
Their biggest complaint is cheap imports, mostly from Ukraine. It's flooding European markets and hurting the business of farmers in Europe. We took to the streets to protest against Europe and the new laws it is making. Agriculture has already been on its knees for a long time and we took to the streets because we have reached the end of our rope. We are demanding a better tomorrow with lower production costs, lower fuel prices, lower electricity prices and a fair distribution of subsidies. Now while this story is about Europe, let me digress a bit. Because for our viewers in India, the scenes may look familiar. India went through something similar. Farmers took to the streets in 2020, protesting against new farm laws. The West was quick to lecture. They slammed the Indian government and its handling of the situation. Countries like Canada also tried to stoke the fire. The protests continued for months. Finally, the government gave in. It made concessions. Now, Europe is witnessing the same and headlines like these have emerged. Police moved to end Dutch farmer protests. Whatever happened to their freedom of expression? The point here is simple. Protests are a part and parcel of democracy, but they cannot be allowed to cross a line and hurt public order. When they do, law enforcement agencies have to act in India and in Europe. Our next story is about the sun. It is flipping out, quite literally. Scientists say the sun's poles are about to flip. Just like the Earth, the Sun has two magnetic poles, the magnetic north and the magnetic south. On Earth, the poles rarely change their order. They flip once every hundreds of thousands of years. But on the Sun, it is a fairly regular occurrence. The poles flip about every 11 years. They last reversed in 2013, and you don't have to be a math genius to know that the next reversal will take place this year. Scientists say it will be an epic transformation but they also claim that it can be terrifying for us. So how will this shuffle impact the Earth? Should Earthlings be scared? No matter which school you went to, you were bound to learn three things by rote. One, the Pythagoras theorem. Two, mitochondria are powerhouse of the cell. And three, the sun is a big ball of fire. This story is about that last bit. Because this year, the ball of fire is quite the hot topic. For starters, a total solar eclipse is predicted in April. This happens when the moon crosses paths with the sun, blocking it from view. It is a highly anticipated event for scientists. But they are concerned over one thing, fact that the sun itself is getting ready to flip. Its poles are about to reverse. Here's how. Just like the Earth, the Sun has two poles, the magnetic north and the magnetic south. Every 11 years, the polar magnetic fields weaken. They go to zero and then emerge again with much more energy, but with opposite polarity. So the north pole becomes the south and vice versa. This is a regular part of the solar cycle, unlike the one on Earth where the poles flip once every hundreds of thousands of years. The sun's poles last reversed in 2013. Even those bad at math will know that the next due date will be sometime this year. Now this may sound scary, but the flip is not a big deal. What comes before the flip is? Leading up to the pole reversal, the sun has intense magnetic activity. Right now, the sun is more active than it's been in over a decade. During these periods, the sun displays extravagant fireworks. There are solar flares or mass ejections. Scientists call them solar storms. Think of them as explosions. They hurl charged matter out of the sun. And it is shot across the solar system at a speed of hundreds of thousands of kilometers per hour. These particles can reach Earth in typically three days. And the results depend on what happens next. Remember, we told you about the Earth's magnetic poles? That's because the Earth has a magnetic field too. Usually, this field acts like an umbrella. It deflects the storm, much like rain bounces off an umbrella. But sometimes, the storm is so strong, it rips through the Earth's magnetic field. And the results can vary. On the positive side, solar storms can result in vivid auroras. Which is why this year the Northern Lights will be stronger than they have been in at least a decade. 
but in some scenarios solar storms can be the perfect storm for disasters they can disrupt communication satellites and gps in space and disable electrical grids on the ground the possibility of such a hit is rare but it can happen like it did in 1859 when the earth witnessed the carrington event it was the worst solar storm in history it disrupted telegraph lines hindered messages sparked fires and auroras were witnessed in mexico city it was a shock event and if a similar incident occurs now it could cost economies trillions but in most cases this active time for the sun is not dangerous it has more positives than negatives for starters scientists have an opportunity to dig deep into the sun secondly you can start planning your next vacation for our last story today let's turn our attention to zimbabwe not the african nation of zimbabwe i'm talking about zimbabwe do you know what it is have you ever heard of an upper decky lip pillow Okay let me ask you an easier question. Do you know what zin is? Z Y N. If these words sound like a made up language to you, do not feel bad. Most adults do not know what zin is, but Gen Z do, which is alarming on so many levels because zin is a brand of nicotine pouches. Think tobacco dips minus the tobacco, but all of the nicotine. There is about 12 mg of nicotine per pouch. 15 such pouches cost about $4. Each pouch is a tiny sack the size of a gum. It comes in all kinds of fun flavors, bubble gum, blueberry, lime. It has to be nestled between the lip and the gum. The nicotine slowly leaks out of the paper. Accessing and using these pouches is easy and this poses a difficult problem. According to the World Health Organization, nicotine pouches are a major health concern. They contain exceptionally high levels of nicotine, which is an addictive chemical. They can affect nervous and cardiac system, damage DNA, even lead to cancer. But zin influencers couldn't care less. They are influencers and they have one goal: to promote nicotine pouches like Zin on social media and their target audience is the youth, especially children. These influencers have made nicotine pouches trendy by promoting them as an effective tool to quit vaping. Some are shipping pouches directly to customers or giving user discounts on their profiles, and children are lapping these up. The market for nicotine pouches doubled between 2020 and 2021 in one year the market has doubled in Croatia the Czech Republic Denmark Slovakia and the United Kingdom In the UK 1 in 25 people have tried a nicotine pouch The biggest user group here is 18 to 24 year olds in America about 16% of the same age group have tried these pouches and about 2% of middle school students use them every month The sales have skyrocketed in America as well. Now Zin is the crown jewel of a multi-billion dollar tobacco company. 105 million tins of Zin were sold in America just in the third quarter last year, earning 9 billion dollars in revenue. By mid-January this year, the sales were up 87 percent. Nicotine pouches are all the rage in Australia as well. Children are carrying them to school. and they're slowly gaining popularity in Japan and India at this point nicotine pouches are not just products they are a subculture a language among the young hashtags like amazing zinful zin laden garner hundreds of millions of views they're brewing culture wars they have riled up politicians they have become the latest success story of influencers you see influencers are not your traditional pitch people think of them as the coolest kids on the block they gain millions of followers thanks to their personality not so much their experience expertise or credibility and they promote all kinds of things from skin care to crypto to diets and vapes sometimes they're paid to make baseless claims and they don't mind being deceitful in their approach like in this video where a grown influencer portrays as a 6th grader talking about the need for nicotine pouch before participating in a spelling bee Young people are susceptible to this kind of promotion. The result is sometimes slightly amusing, like children running around Sephora aisles trying new skincare products. But in most cases it can be dangerous. We see this with vapes. 
There now a growing epidemic among children and it is no shock that adults rarely know about such trends because social media algorithms are too efficient for their own good. They serve problematic influencers on a digital platter but only to children. Meanwhile, adults see content on gardening and vacuum cleaners. Influencers and social media algorithms are a potent combination, possibly the most powerful tool of advertising ever invented. And like most things on social media, influencers are still vastly unregulated. They're not held accountable. As we lose an entire generation in the tragic vortex of social media, because to governments, social media is still a monster they cannot control. Now, if only there was an influencer to teach them how. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In California, torrential downpours sweep the state, leaving behind flooded streets, mudslides and debris. In Germany, floats for the Cologne Carnival poke fun at world leaders. And in the UAE, camel breeders compete in the kingdom's annual festival. Finally, we're taking you back in history on this day in 1992. European nations signed the Maastricht Treaty. It led to the creation of the European Union. It also led to the formation of a single European currency, the Euro. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Der war. From impeachments to inaugurations, if it's a political story, we are on the scene. The race for the White House is heating up. We're beating Biden. How dare he say that? If it's breaking news, we're live with the latest coverage. From the White House, the State Department, and Capitol Hill, we know the issues, but above all, we know the players to bring you the latest in-depth analysis on all the key stories that we're covering. I'm Eric Ham. Join me from Washington here on First Post America.